Sort of. I was kayaking the Florida Everglades with my parents. The Everglades are a national park at the very tip of Florida. Here's a map. The park is the part in green. The park for adventurers is right on the west coast, as you can see on this next map. Our routes look something like this. We paddled about 100 miles in 10 days. That's 10 days without a shower, cell phones, the internet, refrigeration, deodorant, laundry machines, Snapchat, air conditioning. You get the point. But we did have a canoe and kayak, 30 gallons of fresh water, 12 days of food, cookware, tent, sleeping bags, flashlights, waterproof camera, clothes, books, and of course, each other. And the other glade provided this. Weather, nice weather. Wildlife, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, here's a mother manatee and a baby. Sea turtles, raccoons, and osprey. The glades also offer peace, beauty, silence, and of course, these guys. They like to give you what looks like the chicken pox. That's my arm on day 10. So who in the right mind does this? And why do I? This guy has one answer. A wilderness must be explored! Stop! Stop! Run! <laughs> Other answers include that peace, beauty, and silence I just mentioned, quality family time, and a spell of simplicity and freedom from the frantic, hasty world. When people think of the Everglades, they often imagine this. Where if you crash your ship in the right place, the place you might meet this guy. <laughs> Not so. The Everglades actually look like this. And this. And this. And my favorite, this. These plants are mangroves, and they cover every so-called shore in the Everglades. They actually grow in mud, so there's very little solid ground. If you're on the coast, you, you're lucky enough to camp on the beaches. But in the interior, you stay on what are called chickies, wooden platforms built above the water. There's space for you and a tent and a porta potty, not much else. If it's buggy, you do dinner in the boats. It's fun. Finally, there are a few campsites on solid ground if you go inland, like this one, called Willy Willy. It was that really, really, in fact, that the porta potty gave us this warning. I was curious at this. What is a potentially dangerous alligator encounter? I got to find out. <laughs> to start, at 1 a.m. on a pitch black night, it sounds like this. So they provide an instruction manual. Here's the rest of that sign from before all. There's a lot here. Don't worry about it. Here are the highlights. First, there's this atrocious mus misuse of a semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody's ever died from misuse semicolons. But I am sure they have died, or someone was shortly about to, from a failure to proofread. See here, this sign tells me to remain vigilant. <laughs> here it is bigger, in case you can't see it. So, so, so let's practice our close reading skills. The author, let's call him or her Cameron, it's a good unisex name, has made an understandable but very significant where my survival is concerned mistake. You see, I think Cameron's confusing, I, I believe, the words vigilant and vigilante. Vigilant means to be watchful. With vigilant, I think of Hamlet and Horatio standing on the ramparts. Vigilant looks like this guy. Vigilante, however, makes me think of an old Nintendo 64 game I played in 8th grade called Vigilante 8, which involved cars and rocket launchers and looked just like this. In our current context, Vigilante 
want, he looks more like this. They all rest on alligators. <laughs> At one point, that little girl thinks she thinks everyone should have a chance to wrestle alligators. I disagree. Uh, but anyway, so you see this big semantic difference here. Should I unpack my binoculars or start sharpening my machete? That was my question. This guy, by the this is, by the way, gentlemen, my spell check is never enough. You must proofread. It could mean the difference between someone's life or death. Just saying. Now, the sign had one last important piece of information. Yes, that's right. My responsibility is proofread. So you got it, Cameron. Let's beat to the hills. One problem. Here's a map of our campsite. You can see here the picnic table, the porta potty, me and my tent, the impenetrable vegetation surrounding one half of the campsite, and the water and mangroves surrounding the other half. Please note that the only real exit, ladies and gentlemen, via the canoe is precisely where Alfred has stationed himself. Retreat? Yes, Alfred. The, alli the alligator has an official name. He has an epithet, too. Alfred, the human habituated alligator. <laughs> and human habituated here, I think, is a euphemism for man eater. Somehow the park service forgot to tell me that I should write my will before my trip. The same way, I think, that the ranger at the station where we checked in forgot to call the other ranger station to make sure that our campsite choices were, in fact, available. But we reminded him. Imagine the phone call. Willie, Willie? Why, well, yes, it is open. I'll call Petco right now and cancel this week's order, Fresh Dead Deer. Thanks, Sherry. So there we were. Mom said we should climb atop the picnic table. I thought that was a good idea. High ground. But do we turn on our flashlights? This was the debate. While we debated, Alfred felt quiet, and Dad wondered, maybe he was just talking to his friends. Great, now Alfred has friends. And he's inviting them over for, over for dinner. Maybe. Then Alfred growled again, but he had moved. We got on the picnic table pretty quickly. <laughs> now there we are, 2 a.m., on top of the picnic table, waving flashlights in the middle of the wilderness, a bit scared, Alfred the alligator hanging out over yonder. Oh, and it had rain conditions in January. Ranger Sherry had informed us back at the ranger station. So, quote, there will be a few more mosquitoes than usual. <laughs> and did I mention that we could also hear one of Alfred's friends, not too far off? But here the miracle arrives. Our picnic table, which I'm about to rebrand the Alamo, is situated close enough to the portify that we can read all three, yes, three, signs bolted to it deal, describing how we should deal with alligators. I already covered the first one. The second one is really only helpful if you suffer from a severe lack of survival instinct. The third sign, however, was the key to our salvation. 1-800 number. Is it toll free, I wonder? Oh yes, but we're in the wilderness, so therefore there's no cell service, as this Verizon ad made quite, makes quite clear. <laughs> so in other words, my dad's iPhone is useless, and I have, a, I have a dumb phone, so that was already useless to begin with. So Steve Jobs, I think, or I wonder, or I would like to point out, could put two cameras, a semi-intelligent AI system, a flashlight, a fingerprint scanner, the internet, and Candy Crush into his handheld computer, but he could not handle his flamethrower. I think that's rather disappointing. But we did have a spray, a, a spray can of bug spray that someone had left in the porta potty. Mom wondered that maybe the last guy had sat in there all night can at the ready. Yeah, Dad added, he held a butane torch in his other hand. So let's do a little chemistry. What do you get? Ah. <laughs> so there's Steve Jobs, there's real American ingenuity. You can keep vigilant for your 4G, but this English teacher is going full on vigilante. Not really. While Mom and Dad made trips to the tent for essential supplies, I stood on the picnic table, looking something like this. Mom thought it was pretty cool that she saw Alfred's eye. I stayed on the picnic table. <laughs> then, after we didn't hear Alfred for 30 minutes, Mom went back to sleep. I stayed up. <laughs> then Dad decided to go back to sleep. I decided rather heroically to stand guard over my parents like the brave son that I am. It was a long night, but nothing else happened. Alfred had long since swum away. But I jumped at every crack stick, every fish splash, every night noise. And don't forget about, don't forget about those mosquitoes. Four hours later, dawn finally crept to the sky. I woke up my parents, we made coffee, packed up camp, and paddled off into the new day. It was a beautiful morning. Okay. So, I believe that the very ex experience we have, we, should, we need to ask, what does this have to teach me? Obviously, I was in the right state of mind to answer that question at the moment, back then, but I have considered it since. So let's talk briefly about fear. 
We talk about being fearless and having courage, but we, can, we tend to confuse them and think that courage is fearlessness. But some think differently. The Greek philosopher Plato said that courage is knowing what not to fear. But this also must mean, I think, that courage is knowing what to fear. <laughs> fear is useful. Fear has power. Among other things, it keep us, keeps us humble, like the Leviathan reading we just heard. And fear also keeps us vigilant, and we must remain vigilant. For instance, I was afraid that you might think I just said remain vigilant to you, and that you'll go strap a rocket launcher to my car when we're done. So with that fear, I prefer this to talk very carefully. But if fear has power, if courage is knowing what to fear, then courage must also, I think, mean knowing how to fear. But to remain vigilant or vigilante, that's the question. The vigilante turns fear into violence. We recognize this. Look at the flamethrower jokes I just made. Look at how we all laughed. We see vigilante every day in the news, sometimes closer home than just the news. It is sometimes a declaration of war, sometimes it's a hate speech against the other, and it is also when a dog is put down for biting a kid that poked him with a stick for a laugh. But to compel and to justify that violence, the vigilante recruits hatred. He demonizes what he fears and calls it things like monster and evil. But you can't demonize someone without sanctifying yourself. Then the fight becomes a fight of good and evil, and I wonder about that separation sometimes. My fear turned Alfred into this. By the way, humans created Godzilla, the story goes, when the nuclear bomb tests mutate the lizard. They got angry when that lizard came and stomped around New York City, but what were those bombs for? Which is my question. How often do we create the evil and the monsters that we later, and with rather great self-righteousness, try to destroy? Let's look again at the signs I mocked. Here's the key. When people feed alligators, they lose their fear of humans and become dangerous. This is what human habituated really means. Not man-eating at all, but man-fed. We think it's funny or kind to feed animals, maybe sometimes cute, but then the animals get used to people. And then something happens. It gets too close, it growls, it scares us, maybe because our, what I think was my home, is actually its home. And then we kill it, or we call someone else to kill it. There's a saying that a fed bear is a dead bear. And then all the while, we make the animal, or something else than the animal, into a monster for trying to live the only way that it knows how. Similarly, those we saw threaten or harm become hate and threaten us. A song by Guster that I listen to now and then says, says, Step on a kid, the girl hating you. I'll avoid political examples, but I will mention the masculinity documentary that we all watched. Near the end, one of the convicted murderers relates how he was abused by his mother, and also by cultural ideas of masculinity. Then he concludes in a paraphrase, I guess that's why I could kill someone. I value their life so little because I never learned the value of my own. It's hard to call that man evil once you understand him. It's hard to hate him. I at least even felt compassion for him, empathy, even love. Which leads me to conclude that fear grants us a choice, to hate or to love. Hatred is a decision not to understand. Love is the decision to try to. So you say, I am afraid. Now what do I do? Do I demonize, denigrate, destroy? Or do I work to understand with humility and compassion and attention? Do I let my fear blind me with terror and hate? Or do I use it to stay alert for what needs my compassion and my courage and hopefully something approaching wisdom? Will I remain vigilante or vigilant? Thank you.